we have a riddle for you. I have six children from six different mothers. And I have six children from six different fathers. How many children do we have? The right answer is, we have six children. And they all came into our family in their own unique way. If somebody had told us 20 years ago that we would be parents to six children, we would have laughed into their faces with disbelief. And yes, we did talk about our future family before the wedding, that one day it would be good to adopt someone. For some reason, we just believed it's going to be a good thing to do. And then two years into the marriage, after we had lost our first child through miscarriage, we thought that was the one day. We decided to not wait any longer and applied for adoption. Our first son came home on Christmas Eve. He was only one month old, and we never stopped ever since. Several years after the appearance of each child, once things got settled down, we would decide there was still space for one more. Not all of the children came as babies, and we had a biological child somewhere in the middle. So right now, we have two adult children living independently, ages 24 and 21, and four still living with us, ages 18, 13, 7, and almost 1. Although we get surprised looks when people hear we have six children, our life seems quite ordinary to us. Noise non-stop. If you want to have your own quiet time, probably you have to wake up the earliest before anybody's up, or you have to lock yourself up in the bathroom, although that doesn't work most of the time because somebody will definitely knock in on the door. Large pots, another reality. Oh yes, large pots. In fact, we don't know how to cook in small amounts anymore. Eight liters of soup, not five kilos of potatoes, two kilos of meat. Every recipe we take, we just multiply it by four, and then it's about the right amount. Now, the good side of it, if you ever stop by to visit us, there is always something to eat in the fridge. We may not necessarily have clean plates, but there is food. And piles of laundry. It seems like I can never get to the bottom of the laundry basket, no matter how hard I try. I never see the bottom of it. If I do by some miracle, it's only for a couple of moments until somebody comes back from a walk. Every time I go shopping, I look like a mule carrying two to four bags full of groceries. Then I call my, uh, on my boys to help me to bring them up to the fourth floor. The smaller ones unpack the bags and put everything in its place. Actually, we make sure that everything has its place because in an apartment of the size we have, if you don't put it back into a place, you're going to live in a mess very soon. Speaking of mess, dirty dishes is another challenge. It only takes one meal for our family, and the sink starts overflowing with stuff to wash. So we rely on our kids for help. I think the person who invented a dishwasher deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Everybody in our family, after the age of seven, gets their own dishwashing duty, day or week, depending on the age. And so they do the cleanup in the evening, and our kitchen looks marvelous at night. <laughs> Very clean. So thanks to our kids, we don't have to do dishes. Our chore is to make sure that they do, and that's quite a chore. And bathroom is the hottest place in our apartment. At least three people at the same moment want to get there, and there's always a queue. So the moment you get in and try to relax, somebody will definitely lock and knock on the door with a plea, could you please let me in or national tragedy will happen. So you rush, you do everything fast, you open the door just to find out that the person who was so urgent changed his mind <laughs> and will come back later. So here we are now, a family with six kids. The realities that we described are normal everyday realities of many families with several children. They have become ordinary to us. In the same way, different ways of having children have become ordinary to us. Adoption, biological, foster care, they're all normal ways for us of forming a family. It's quite normal for our kids at a certain age to ask other kids, who gave birth to you? Because, you know, your parents adopted you, who gave birth to you? 
Or sometimes they would ask young parents of infants, did you give birth to him or did you take him? <laughs> or it's also normal for us to celebrate not only their birthdays, but also the days when they came into our family. And we understand, on another hand, that in our context, our family is somewhat unusual, even though it's quite ordinary to us. When all of us walk down the street, we get stares, and sometimes uh, we hear discussions behind our backs. Things like, are they all theirs? No, this one cannot be theirs. Too old or too, too light here. Yes, they're all ours. They just came into our family, each one in their own time and in their own unique way. We still have a long way to go. Only half of our children are adults. But even to get where we are here, where we are now, we had to deal with deep personal fears that sometimes felt paralyzing. Some of the fears we're still struggling with. Roman, what was your greatest fear? Well, as a man, one of my greatest fears was, will I be able to love them? Will my heart be big enough to embrace all of them? Will there be enough room for all of them? So I just had to take a leap of faith and hope that my heart would follow. And to my surprise, my heart did follow. I fell in love with the youngest children we adopted within a month. And with our last baby, who was 10 days old, I fell in love within basically hours or days. And today, when I come back after a hard day of work or a long trip, I put him on my lap, I play with him, and you know, Looking at him gives me a fresh perspective on what really matters in life. Now, with older kids, it did take longer. We had to catch, catch up on years and years of no mutual experience. We had to build trust, then respect. I had to spend time getting to learn everything about them and let them to learn something about me. But what I realized, but the, the more you put in, the more you have. That love is the result of personal intent and work and effort. For some reason, I was never scared that I would not be able to love children. It's very easy for me to attach. For me, a greater fear was, will I be a good mom? Feeling that the kids are mine comes pretty naturally to me. But having that feeling does not guarantee that I will raise them well. And the many mistakes that we made were and are constantly feeding that fear. We have not always given them the patience that they needed. We would forget that lying and stealing and extreme attention seeking are expressions of trauma. And we would get angry and punish and yell where we should have supported and calmed and understood. We said things that no kid wants to hear from a parent, things that were not true, things that were hurtful. And then after a fight, we would look at them at night when they're sleeping and hate ourselves. We had to apologize a lot. And one of the greatest lessons that I learned, and I think I'm still learning, is the one of forgiving myself and moving on after a parenting failure. And I think you do need to cut yourself some slack sometime. I am getting better, though. Uh, the period of beating myself over the head has reduced significantly. I learned to remind myself that I am also a work in progress, just like the kids are. That not perfect can be good enough. That's a scary thought. I learned to hope that the not perfect family that they have will be good enough for them. And that one day we might pay for their therapy. And another fear of ours and mine particular uh, was, what if they turn out to be bad people? What if, despite all our efforts, they walk astray? What if their past is so strong that it will define their future? In my imagination, I almost heard people telling me words like, didn't we tell you that nothing good will come out of that? Or, don't you know what responsibility that is? You have to be really prepared. And it seemed that sometimes our kids did their best to prove the point. They lied notoriously, they stole things from family members and friends, they missed school, they broke things, broke things and never acknowledged, and that list can go on and on and on. 
at some point, I even thought that I became a lie expert. I could identify a person lying by the slightest move of eyes and the change in the skin color and the breathing intensity. I could know when you're lying. <laughs> I remember one instance after a long conversation with one of my children that lying is very hurtful and a sincere promise that it will never happen again, I found my pockets empty the next morning. I felt lost, I felt angry, frustrated, and yet with God's grace we moved on. But when I saw the deep transformation in him and what kind of person he became later, I was so proud of him. Later, I realized that those fears of mine were normal fears for any dad, be it of a biological, adopted or foster. I realized that we don't control their destiny, we don't control their choices, but we do control how much love and affection we give them today. They're like hard soil that take much more effort to grow anything on it, but when it does grow, it gives such a tremendous joy and satisfaction. Self-talk is what we do a lot in our family, uh, reminding ourselves of the truth. There are things I can control and things I can't control. And I have a habit of mixing those two. So in order to survive the paralyzing fears, I have to constantly tell myself the truth and focus on the good. Yes, they may not turn out the way I expect them to or the way I think is right, but have I done what's in my power? Have I given them the love of the affection, have I given them the family, the adults who they can call their own, so that later when they grow up, they can remember, sometimes with anger, sometimes with laughter, sometimes with fondness, this is how my family did it, instead of this is what we did in the orphanage. And another fear of mine was, will I have enough time for myself? I realized that every time we were thinking about taking another child, I had to struggle with my inner self and my selfishness. Thinking of it, I thought of that by the time we're done, I'll be 65. And maybe I will have enough time to live for myself then. So I was very curious what other dads have for me to say about that. And one advice in particular was very useful. It stated, don't sacrifice everything you like for your children. Instead, invite them to, jo and to join you in what you enjoy. So we travel long distances together, we play football or basketball, we do fishing, we do homework, we do cooking, all together. And to my surprise, doing it with them, sometimes I enjoy it even more than do it on my own. And I make sure that I do have time for myself every day. I need 20 to 30 minutes a day to be by myself. Of course, 20 to 30 minutes straight could be quite a luxury. So I've learned to, to use 10 minutes, 15 minutes here and there. A 10 minute walk from school after I drop the kids off there. Uh, 15 minute reading of a book or drinking a hot cup of tea. Five minutes of a brainless phone game. Recently, I started jogging, which in my case is rather a shuffle but I am amazed at how well it clears my head. I take the saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, really seriously. <laughs> my husband, very smart guy, once told me that in this ocean of life, we should stop waiting until we reach the final destination and rest then. We should grab onto little islands or pieces of wood flo floating in the water where we could rest for a little bit, but regularly. I've taken this wise advice to heart. And for us, in order to stay sane, we had to learn how to ask for help and actually to be able to accept that help. In our case, it really takes a village to raise one child. And we have an amazing village, even though we live in the city. Our relatives and friends are involved in helping us in many ways, from meals to babysitting, to growth-promoting conversations with our children, from listening to us and supporting us when we cry and complain, to rejoicing with us, celebrating with us when, when we rejoice. 
we have heard again and again that our limits are often inside of us and that fears are one of the greatest limits. Although for us, our life does not seem to be life beyond limits, we have been given an opportunity to work with some limiting fears. And this experience has been freeing, enjoyable and satisfying. And looking back at everything we experienced and knowing everything we know, would we do it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.